six people. <laughs> I mean, bars are closed. I mean, <laughs> unless there are private parties out there. I mean, we'll see how many people join. I don't know, is there a test today? Organic chemistry or cell bio. Yeah, they got a couple people online, regulars. There's one more, number seven. Almost a waste to meet in the same, in this big room for it. All right, take a peek outside. I guess that might be it. All right, so those of you that are actually here, morning, Friday, can't wait, can't wait. We do have a football game, what time? Evening, all right, evening tomorrow, so gives you something to do, not a whole lot to do in this town. Do you, know, do you know what kind of tests you used? Okay. Stats class is getting to the point where we're going to do, like, if you test positive, what's the likelihood that you actually have it? So we're going to use those tests. It depends on the test. Depends on the, on the frequency in the population as well. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I haven't. I haven't looked them up. I'm going to do that after our class. After today, I, or I'll, I'll take a look at it. But I can tell you that at the blood donor center, they do the antibody testing, uh, and they list like all the different ones that that they have available. Uh, and the first couple times, the, the results actually listed what tests they used. So I could, you can go to that list and see what the sensitivity and specificity was. I thought it was pretty cool. And they actually told you what it was tested on. So I think the first test that, that, they, that they used, um, and this was back in, let's see, it was October. Let me go back. September, August, July. July's donation for me was um, out of 400, 400 individuals that were in that sample. It was 100% sensitive, 100% spe specific. I don't believe that, but that's what it was. So we'll go. And incidentally, a big part of the, the inaccuracies of all of those have been human error, testing error. <laughs> a person set it up wrong, contaminants. So, all right. Hey, number eight. Number eight, morning. All right, so we have a couple things. Next week we have a lab, it's outside, grasshoppers. So um, if you can drive, we'd appreciate it. We'll meet in the lab first, and then um, we'll take our quiz. Meet in the lab, take our quiz, get a brief description of what we're doing, brief overview since we have pictures and we could draw, draw up on the board, uh, and then we will meet out at the Red Arroyo. Uh, we collect our sampling effort is about an hour. So we're gonna try to sample the same amount of time for across all the labs uh, so that by about four o'clock we're gonna be done uh, and what we'll do is, I know at least in my class, I'll collect all of the paint, I'll collect the nets, and bring those back to the, to, to the lab. So if 
you live off campus, you can just head, head back to your, to your place uh, from the Red Arroyo. Second thing, we have the exams. They're done. So I went through and uh, checked some stuff out. So I think all the grades changed uh, because I had one that was counted as five points and it was it actually should have only been four points. So that was corrected. Uh, I think the total was out of 81 points. Uh, check your grade. You should have access to your exam so you can see what you missed. If you have a question, if you don't know why you missed something, all right, there is a process before you come talk to me, and that is look in your notes. All right, look in the notes. Actually, first, read the question carefully, and then go and look at your notes and read your notes carefully. All right? So check that, and then if you still think it should be correct, then you know, prepare an argument as to why you think I should give you credit for, for that answer. In some cases, it may just be, hey, you know, you told us this in the notes, and it's right here, but, and that's what I marked, but it was wrong. Sometimes I make a mistake, I'll get that corrected. And if you catch it and come talk to me, then that means everyone else who had that wrong, or everyone else who answered the same way also had that wrong. So then I'll just go back, you know, update the, update the, the exam, and it'll, uh, and it'll auto grade it, it'll fix it. All right. So, but if there is something that you really do think that you know you should get credit for, have an argument, and then either stop by my, my office hours or email uh, email me. We can set up a time either in person or we can do like a collaborate session or a Google Meet session, uh, and we can go over um, go over that 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 question. All right. But a lot of it's on you to check check what was missed. Overall grades were, were actually pretty good. Uh, has me thinking that I was too easy on you. <laughs> so, all right. Any questions? Right now, I guess I should go back here. All right. Any questions? So this is where we left off. So we're on water stress, water balance in plants, right? And we've, we have this problem. So the plant's problem is drying out. So to try to avoid this evaporative loss, you know, through transpiration, the plants will close their stomata and limit how much access to air there is to that interior of the leaf, all right? When they do that, they also block gas exchange. And that's going to be problematic for our plants because if the concentration of CO2 falls, then that can inhibit photosynthesis and some very bad things can happen, including photorespiration. So one of our adaptations that the plants could, could have developed is a change on where or when fixation and assimilation occurs. So we define our fixation as taking the CO2 from the air and incorporating it into some sort of organic compound. And then assimilation is actually getting that CO2 integrated into a metabolic cycle to produce sugar. So we've kind of separated those two, those two things out. All right. So to introduce you to this, we presented the C3 cycle. This cycle is going to be uh, happening in the vast majority of plants that are out there, uh, I want to say it's probably almost 90%. Could, I don't quite know that exact percentage, but the vast majority of plants are C3 plants. All right. In C3 plants, our carbon gets fixed into a three-carbon sugar molecule, hence the C3 part of it. All right. With this step, they take the CO2, they fix it, and assimilate it all at the same time. So they get it out of the air and into the Calvin cycle. All right, so the Calvin cycle is where we want to get in order to assimilate our carbon. All right, how it gets there in a C3 plant is it integrates it immediately, it takes that CO2, binds it to uh, RUBP, and then produces these uh, PGA molecules. And then these, one of them goes out to the output to produce more sugars. The second one gets recycled to produce more of this RUBP as a cycle. Now, this step takes energy. All right. Regeneration takes energy. 
and it gets the, the plant gets that energy from the light reactions. So capturing the sunlight, energizing those electrons, the electro, electrons pass down uh, their gradient, releasing energy along the way that the plant captures to produce ATP. That ATP gets used to regenerate our UBP. All right. Now I said this is a simplified description, and it is. All right. Our focus is, you know, things that we, we need to know is here. We don't need to know all of the different molecules and, and how much ADP is used or how, how much this NADPH is, is used and so forth. All right. Our focus is on the adaptation that allows our plants to conserve water. All right. This is why it's important to talk about it. If our concentration of CO2 drops too low, perhaps because the stomata are closed, then our rubisco, that enzyme that's, that's fixing and assimilating our CO2 in the C3 plants, is going to start to bind oxygen. And when it binds oxygen, it doesn't produce two PGAs like it did normally. It's going to produce one PGA and one molecule of PG. All right. The PGA gets recycled to produce RUBP. But this PG doesn't go into a, an, an energy producing pathway. It's actually, it has to be transformed again to get back to where it can be usable, you know, by our plants in these cycles. So overall, if we go down this route, this photorespiration route, what's going to happen is that our plant is going to start consuming more energy than it produces. That is the carbon starvation part of it. All right, why the plants can die when their stomata are closed. All right, so our first adaptation is to change where fixation and assimilation occurs inside of our plants. Separate where we're capturing the CO2 and where we integrate it into that Calvin cycle. All right, and this is our C4 pathway plants. C4 pathway plants. Uh, occur in a small percentage of plants. Probably the second most common, but that's kind of a, a misleading statement because it's not like we're at 30 or 40 percent of plants. All right, we're under 10 percent of plants that ha that do this C4 pathway. All right. So in this pathway, what we're going to do is take CO2, or the plant takes CO2 and fixes it, it fixes it as a four-carbon molecule. All right, hence the C4. So it fixes it as a four carbon molecule. How does it do that? Well, what it's going to do is it, you have the CO2 that, that is brought into the leaf, comes in through the stomata, and then it's going to interact and it's going to combine with PEP, phosphoenolpyruvate. All right, phosphoenolpyruvate. That enzyme that catalyzes that reaction is phosphoenolpyruvate carboxylase, PEPC. All right. So we take CO2, PEPC captures it and combines it with PEP to produce this four carbon molecule, OA, oxaloacetate. And from this molecule, it gets changed to malate. All right. So it goes from PEP, CO2 combines with it, PEPC catalyzes that reaction, we produce OA and then we produce malate. Malate is the molecule that we're going to, to get to and we need to get that because that malate acts as a shuttling service. That's gonna be our transport molecule that takes the CO2 that it captured. All right, it's now integrated as part of malate. That's going to move through our cells to get to the cells where the Calvin cycle will take place. Once it gets placed, once it gets to that location, and that's where Rubisco is, then malate will give up that CO2 molecule and it's going to give it up to Rubisco to get back into our Calvin cycle. All right. So this is all going to happen in two different locations. Pepsi occurs in one location. Calvin cycle occurs in a separate location. All right. So why is this important? What does it do? Well, Pepsi has a different affinity for carbon dioxide than Rubisco. All right, and we had a graph up here that looked at that affinity. Let's get that up again. I'm going to change our size of the video so you can see it. 
All right, so we had that graph. Concentration of CO2, that's on our x-axis. We had O2 generation on the y-axis. We said that's our zero point. So oxygen is neither being generated or being consumed. Right. We have our positive up there, negative up here. If we're in our positive, we have photosynthesis occurring. And again, names are a little bit misleading. We're actually producing energy through photosynthesis. If we're in our negative, you can say that we are photorespiring. If we're C3 plants, but we are consuming energy at this point. And we're consuming more energy. That's bad, bad, poorly written. We're consuming more energy than what we're producing by photosynthesis. All right, that's the idea. Photosynthesis is making more energy than what our plant consumes, which is a good thing. So during light, during the day, our plant's going to have excess energy. All right, it's generating that excess energy so it can continue living and surviving and operating at night. So we're going to be at positive gains here, and then in the negative, we're consuming more than we're actually producing. With our C3 plants, we said it had moderate affinity. And our line looked something like that, where our comp CO2 compensation point was someplace around there. So this is our CO2 compensation point. That's our point where energy produced balances energy consumed. That's our break-even point. And we said for the C3 plants that if we fall below that CO2 compensation point, what's going to happen is that our, our rubisco starts binding oxygen in that process called photorespiration starts consuming a lot more energy than it can produce. What about these C4 plants? These C4 plants utilize PEPC, different enzyme, which means we have different enzyme kinetics. For a C4 plant, it's going to look something like this. Our CO2 compensation point, much, much lower. which means it's really not going to be susceptible to photorespiration. It's not, and I'll even go that next step and say it's not susceptible because it's not going to bind oxygen. All right? And that's a good thing. All right, that's a good thing. So, Rubisco has a moderate affinity for CO2. This is going to be susceptible to photorespiration because we can easily get down into that area. PEPC, though, won't. It can operate at a much lower CO2 levels. All right, so you just kind of have to think, what happens when our stomata close? So stomata were the stomata were open, gas exchange is occurring, we have CO2 levels increasing inside of our plant leaf. We're getting, you know, let's say it's equilibrium with, with what the environment is. Stomata close conserve energy or conserve water. Rubisco and Pepsi are still working. So while there is those stomata are closed, they are being consumed. They're fixing and assimilating. And then that concentration get, keeps getting lower in C3 plants. Once it hits that compensation point, now we're going to start consuming more energy than we're producing. This is the site of photorespiration, but our Pepsi can continue working until it gets all the way down at the bottom. And hopefully, by it, before we get to that compensation point, things have, times have improved, stomata open, and then gas exchange can bring our concentration back up. All right? So, different enzymes. Different enzymes have different compensation points. These C4 plants make it work by separating where PEPC and where Rubisco operate. So C4 is PEPC. C3 is Rubisco, but again, 
That's just for our fixation steps. All right, C3, fixation assimilation occurs at the same point. C4 plants, fixation happens with Pepsi, and then it unloads to Rubisco. So these C4 plants also have Rubisco in there, but you'll see how, what, what happens here. All right, any questions on our compensation point? We're going to get back to C4s. All right, so Pepsi fixes the carbon, gets it to malate, malate moves it in, to our bundle sheath cells, all right? Moves it into the bundle sheath cells, and then when it's there, it unloads that CO2 to Rubisco. That unloading makes sure that we have a high concentration near a Rubisco so that we avoid photorespiration completely, all right? That's what, that's what we're doing. We're making sure that we always have a high concentration at that Rubisco enzyme. How does it, how do these C4 plants separate the two processes? They separate it using a specific type of anatomy called Krantz anatomy. All right, so Krantz anatomy describes the layout of these leaves, the morphological structures of, of these leaves. In a regular C3 plant, our chloroplasts are scattered throughout the leaf. All right, they're scattered throughout the leaf. So when you have gas exchange happening, they come into the leaf, the gas can kind of filter throughout the leaf. At any point where these green dots are, all right, you have the chloroplasts, you can have your light reactions, you can have your photosynthesis occurring. All right, so it can occur all throughout the leaf, which means that you really can't set up a separate location for this Pepsi and the Rubisco. This is where Krantz anatomy comes in. Krantz anatomy now takes all of those chloroplasts and concentrates them into bundle sheath cells. All right, so these bundle sheath cells are cells that, that basically encircle uh, the vascular system, vascular bundles. All right, so you have gas exchange that comes into our leaf. Our PEPC is in all of these cells in our leaf. But Rubisco is only going to operate in this location. So now hopefully you start seeing how we're separating in space, how we're separating fixation and assimilation in space. We are basically allowing PEPC to occur inside of these cells. We get to malate, and then malate gets transferred, in some cases, between cells, between numerous cells, right to the bundle sheets. And once we get to those bundle sheet cells, then it can release its CO2. It can unload its CO2 right at Rubisco and maintain a high concentration at that point. So while the leaf, the interior of the leaf may have a concentration of CO2 that's all the way down at this point, the concentration near Rubisco is going to be all the way up here. So we've set up different concentration gradients, basically, inside the leaves. All right. So in these plants, when the stomata close, yeah, gas exchange stops. Whatever concentration, whatever CO2 concentration there was inside of those leaves, they're going to, can, they're going to drop. They're going to drop. But Pepsi's can keep operating all the way until it gets down to its, uh, its compensation point, which is much, much lower. We're not going to see photorespiration. So even though the leaf may be down here, the Rubisco concentration, or the concentration right near Rubisco, is going to be well above the CO2 compensation point for that enzyme. Now this is going to continue. Rubisco is going to keep operating. It's going to keep functioning until we run out of malate. All right, so if we have a situation where the plant is completely dry and completely CO2 starved, there is a possibility that our plant will die from that starvation. Still that possibility. But you know, in real world, C4 represents a pretty decent adaptation to combat dry environments. Question. All right, what's the cost? All right, as we said, you know, 
start of this class, any adaptation has a cost, right? has a benefit too. So in this case, we have C4 pathway. We have the separation in space. All right, it must be good because it's persisted, right? But it does have a cost, and what is that cost? Well, it's energetically expensive. It's energetically expensive, and and to kind of understand this, we have to think about how the plants, how organisms allocate their their energy. So, you know, we we'll get to this. We'll get to this later in the class. But our our organisms have a finite amount of energy. All right, and that energy has to be divided between three different processes, maintenance, growth, and reproduction. All right. For the C4 plants, we're talking about maintenance growth. That energy requirement has gone up. Why? It's because we not only have to regenerate that RUBP in the Calvin cycle, but we now have to regenerate PEP, phosphoenyl pyruvate. So PEP was combined with CO2 to produce that OA. All right. We have to get back to that. So the pyruvate that was created, all right, so malate releases its CO2 to, to rubisco, you know, producing pyruvate. That pyruvate gets transported back out, back out of those pundle sheets, and then the pyruvate's going to be transformed back into this PEP. And that costs energy. So we have an extra energy cost in the C4 plants. Also, all of that intracellular transport costs, costs energy. So we're transporting malate, we're transporting this pyruvate between cells. That costs energy. That's a more, that, that's an increased energy cost relative to the C3 plants, which means our C4 plants are gonna be less efficient. And that's why I did the graph as I did. When we have high levels of CO2, and if all conditions are, are fixed, you know, let's say good growing conditions, our C3 plants are gonna be much more efficient. They're gonna produce more energy because they didn't have all of these extra energy costs. And if these C3 plants then are going to be producing a lot more energy, if they're more efficient, well, go back to our energy allocation diagram. That finite energy source goes up. They can allocate it to many different, different uh, pathways, but most important ones will be growth and reproduction at this point. Because as we'll learn, if a plant, a plant or an organism in general is only going to reproduce when they have the energy available to do so. Growth and maintenance are kind of like the, the requirements. They always have to do that, but reproduction is kind of that if. Maybe we do it, maybe we don't. We need that excess energy, and at high levels, high CO2 levels, C3s are going to be much more efficient than the C4 plants. Also, where does it get a lot of this energy? Well, it gets it from the light reactions. All right, so the, the ATP needed to regenerate the RUBP. That comes from the light reactions. The energy needed to regenerate the, the phosphoenyl pyruvate, PEP, all comes from the light reactions. So that means these C4 plants need to be in a lot of light. They can't do well in shade. All right, so when we take a look at C3 and C4 plants, yeah, you're not going to find C3 plants in a forest. I'm sorry, you're not going to find C4 plants in a forest. There's too much shade. They need that high light environment in order to, to regenerate these compounds so they can continue fixing and assimilating carbon. Questions on our C4? Yep. So they didn't evolve it. Well, they did in, in lower CO2 environments. So as this, and we'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> we'll talk about why. So this is actually seems like it's a pretty good, pretty good solution to avoid water, but there's not a whole lot of plants that do this, all right? They're out there. I mean, grasses are basically C4 plants. A lot of grasses are C4 plants. Uh, you know, and it's, it's, it's a way to combat water loss, but, and, and, to do so at, at lower CO2. So you're right. If we're at high CO2 levels, we don't really ever have that need to get CO4. Uh, to, we don't have that need to avoid photorespiration because the chances that we get down to the compensation point when the, when the stomata close will be pretty low. But as 
our evolutionary history, as our global histories, as CO2 levels started to drop down to more modern day levels, now there's this, this urge to avoid the photorespiration. And there's some other aspects to that as well, and we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. All right. So our, our second option is something called the CAM pathway, the Crassulation Acid Metabolism Pathway. All right, this pathway basically uses the same enzymes, uses Pepsi, uses Rubisco, all right? You can say it's, it's almost like it's an equivalent to the C4 pathway, but there's a big difference, all right? C4 pathway separated fixation and assimilation in space. The CAM pathway, these CAM plants separate it in time, all right? So they're not going to have this Kranz anatomy. They don't need it. All right, they're not separating fixation and assimilation in space. They're doing it in time. All right, so what happens? Well, fixation is going to occur at night. Why at night? It's because it's going to be cooler. You're going to have less evaporation. It's going to be easier for the plants to open up the stomata and not worry about having a huge amount of water loss. All right, so we can fix it at night, and then we can just keep fixing it, keep pulling in CO2 and not worry about doing the assimilation step, all right? And we don't have to, because what we're gonna do is store our malate. We're gonna store it in the vacuoles. It's gonna be stored as malic acid, actually. All right, so we're gonna store it in the vacuoles. And then during the day, when the light reactions are actually going on, all right, we're gonna close our stomata. During the day, it's hotter, higher chance of evaporation. So we're going we're gonna to close it, and then what the plant's going to do is release that malic acid, so transition it back to malate, release it back to Rubisco so that it can unload its CO2 right to Rubisco during the day. All right? So fixation occurs at night, assimilation occurs during the day. And the, the, the idea is very similar. We want to maintain a very high concentration of CO2 right near Rubisco. So our pathway, again, very similar. We go to this PEP plus CO2 to produce OA. That gets transitioned right to malate, all right? And then malate gets moved into the vacuole. So once in the vacuole, then it transitions to malic acid. Why does it do that? Malic acid's a little bit better storage molecule, all right? A little bit easier to store it in the vacuoles as a malic acid. And then when it's ready to get released, it transitions back to malate and then malate gets uh, moved out of the vacuole and can now release its CO2 to the Calvin cycle here, right, producing pyruvate. And then we can regenerate PEP right, We're during the day. So we can regenerate PEP. We can re regenerate RUBP. We can have all of that stuff. We don't do that at night. Questions on CAM plants. So what kind of plants do this? You can say succulents. I mean, a lot of cacti do that, do this pathway. Where do those live? Where do those plants live? They live in deserts, very dry environments, very dry high light environments, all right? So what's the difference between CAM and C3 and C4 plants? CAM plants represent the most extreme adaptation for conservation of water. You can say that they are the extreme energy conservers. Why? It's because they only open up their stomata at night, and they do that because it's cooler, less chance of evaporation. All right, and thus they conserve a huge amount of water. These plants are only going to be found, though, in these very high light environments. Why? It's because this pathway is very energetically expensive. It has the exact same cost as C4, so we have to regenerate PEP. All right? We have to regenerate RUBP. That's fine. We have to transport malate. All right? That same cost as C4 plants. But we also have transition to malic acid. All right? that, that adds a little bit of energy cost. And we also have this complex regulatory pathway 
to ensure that Pepsi only works at night and Ru Rubisco doesn't, and then during the day that Rubisco works during the day, but Pepsi does not. And there's a lot of interesting things about how the plant accomplishes it. It accomplishes it with phosphorylation of these enzymes. All right? It accomplishes it by turning on and off these genes to produce more of these enzymes. All right? It's a very complex regulatory network. And what triggers it? Temperatures. Temperatures trigger it. Concentrations of malate and pyruvate, they trigger it. So the cane plants have a much more complex regulatory pathway to make it work, and all of that costs energy. So where does our cane plants fit here? Well, they're using phosphoenyl pyruvate carboxylase. So they're using PEPC, which gives us basically the same uh, compensation point. But our cane plants are going to be way down here. And it's really emphasizing this idea that these cam plants really aren't very energy efficient in terms of, of producing energy, you can say. All right? They can survive, but they have all of these high costs that they really aren't going to have a whole lot of extra. So when we think about these plants and think about how often do they grow or how quickly they grow and how much do they reproduce? Compared to all the other plants, the cane plants are going to grow very slowly. All right? They're not going to have a huge amount of reproduction because they don't have this excess energy that they're constantly producing. All right? So all things considered, if we're all the way up here, C3 plants are going to be favored. They are the most efficient. They're going to have the highest fitness. Cane plants are going to be down here. But Right? Fitness is, is determined by the entire environment. So it's not just CO2. It's also water. It's also sunlight. So taking all of these things into consideration, we can start to see how in certain areas, in certain environments, C4 plants might be favored over C3 and CAM. In other environments, CAM plants might be favored over all of these, even though they have such, such low efficiencies. question on, on the CAM plants. So CAM, C4, separation in space. CAM is all separation in time. Should probably have zoomed in. All right. So we had a question about evolution. And, you know, I guess C4 wasn't really favored until you know, CO2 concentrations dropped, and that is 100% correct. So we have a question. So why C4 cam plants are not dominant? You kind of think that if water stress is an important, an important factor for the success of plants, that plants are going to evolve mechanisms to avoid that water stress, to retain all the water that they can, all right? And, but we don't really see that all the way because we have to consider both the costs and the benefits to these different pathways. So overall, why, do we, do, why don't we see a whole lot of C4 or CAM plants? Why aren't C4 especially dominant? Well, C4 and CAM are less efficient, as we say here. So all things considered, at high CO2 levels, under similar conditions, fitness of C3 will exceed those of the C4 and CAM plants. They're going to do better. They're going to leave more offspring and so forth. They're going to dominate. All right. The second part of it is that we don't really see the concentration of CO2 in those bundle sheaths until our CO2 levels fall. So what, we're, what, what this kind of means is that if we have very high levels of atmospheric CO2, and it was when these plants were, were uh, diversifying, it was much higher than, than it is today. And not just like a double, I mean, it was, it was high. It was high at that time. Right? It's very hard to concentrate CO2 even more in the bundle sheets when we're dealing with that high level. All right? So you didn't, that kind of set up an impediment for the C4 plant evolution. That set up an impediment. So then it didn't really become important until we started dropping down to CO2. And then as CO2 levels dropped, 
then it became easier to concentrate CO2 in these bundle sheath cells to avoid photorespiration. And then the third thing tied to this is that photorespiration doesn't really occur when our temperatures are below 25 degrees. All right, so we have it written up here where Rubisco has this high compensation point, moderate affinity. That's at warmer temperatures. When we're below 25 degrees, that affinity could, could be thought of as increasing. It doesn't. I mean, we have a fixed affinity. But at that level, at that temperature, at those cooler temperatures, oxygen doesn't bind to Rubisco. And if oxygen doesn't bind to Rubisco, then we don't have this photorespiration. All right? So in cooler temperatures, and, and where do we find cooler temperatures? North of us, right? We've got a pretty big area of the globe that has these cooler temperatures, these, these average temperatures that, that you know, really don't get up above 25 for a large part of the year. All, right? all of those areas, do you think they really need C4 plants? Probably not. They can get by with C3s because, hey, it's not really warm enough to see photorespiration. Another area, shaded environments. All right? You need high light I mean, for, this, for the C4 and the cam plants. We need that. But the other thing about being in the shade, other than not having light, is that shade tends to be cooler. So in the shade itself, C3s will be doing better than C4s. I will note that the optimum temperature of Pepsi is at 30 to 35 degrees. So it kind of sets up that temperature that those hotter areas, those areas tended to be high light environments. They tend to be dry environments. Those things tended to favor an enzyme that works much more efficiently at those higher temperatures. Questions? All right, what I think we're going to do is we only have a couple slides of this presentation left. What we're going to do is stop here so that on Monday we can kind of do a quick review of C3, C4 cam plants, finish out the rest of this presentation, and then move on. I don't want to kind of blast through this one, get to the summary, and then you know, release the quiz because we'll really have to push hard to get, get through this presentation today. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll just finish this up on Monday. All right? You all have a good weekend.